Uh, we're going to jump right into this one and get it started. So please welcome our moderator. He's the founder of the Blacklist and the vice president of Overbrook Entertainment, Franklin Leonard. Thank you, Andrew, for that introduction. Um, and before I get started, I want to thank sort of all of the Toronto Film Festival volunteers who are so extraordinary as to be able to come on. Absolutely. Um, and a personal special thanks to Cameron Bailey, um, who's actually the one who me, got me involved in this, which is a, a tremendous honor. And it is a tremendous honor to be here today with uh, Stuart Blumberg, the co-writer and director of Thanks for Sharing, and Sergio Sanchez, the writer of The Impossible. Um, I'm going to let you guys both introduce yourselves. I feel like that's a more organic way to do things, and uh, both of you have resumes that I couldn't possibly remember on my own. So... Um, Stuart, do you want to kick it off? Uh, I was born a middle-class Jewish child in <laughs> Cleveland, Ohio. No, I, I'm, I'm uh, let's see. Uh, I've been writing for about 18 years, uh, pretty much right after college. And um, I grew up in Ohio. I went to Yale. I graduated. I was an investment banker for two years, like all aspiring writers. Um, <laughs> And then I just started writing, and then I started writing for a TV show called Mad TV, and then I started selling film scripts. Uh, and mostly, for, for most of my career, I've written alone. And then over the last, I'd say, six or seven years, I've really started to love collaborations. And one of my last collaborations, I wrote a script with Lisa Cholodango called The Kids Are All Right, which came out a couple years ago. Thank you. And then I just wrote a script a couple of years ago that I directed or co-wrote a script with my friend Matt Winston called Thanks for Sharing that is at the Toronto Film Fest and premieres tomorrow. And I'm really excited to be here. That's it. Uh, I never wanted to write. <laughs> um, I knew I wanted to make films and I suddenly found out that if you wanted to direct a film you, had, you needed a screenplay so I learned how to write a screenplay. Uh, basically, and uh, I spent uh, four years in New York. I studied at NYU and made some short films. And when I came, when I went back to Spain, I had this feature written that uh, I couldn't get produced, and I gave it to a good friend of mine named Juan Antonio Bayona, and he turned it into a movie called The Orphanage, which turned out to be a huge hit in Spain. And then I became a writer <laughs> <laughs> against my will, uh, but I've learned to do it better. <laughs> And I actually kind of enjoy it now, and I'm here to present two films, uh, The Impossible next Sunday and Finn tomorrow. And that's it. Um, I, the thing that strikes me most about the two of you, I was looking through, I made a list of each of your films. Um, and, and the subject matter goes a little bit like this. Um, the Porn Star Next Door as a comedy. Um, a family dramedy about um, a lesbian couple's children who meet their sperm donor father. Um, I'm gonna guess dramedy about sex addiction therapy. Um, a psychological thriller about an orphanage with handicapped children and a family surviving the tsunami. Where, that's a wide variety of topics and obviously not from one person, but where, where, where do your ideas come from? Like what, 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 where, where is the moment where you say, that's a story that I wanna write? Well, for me, it's very simple. I, every single story that I've been attracted to is about the same thing. It's always about a character who's trying to come back to a home that no longer exists. And uh, once, I, I don't know, I'm going to have to talk to my shrink to see why I'm obsessed with those types of stories. <laughs> but uh, once you identify what you're attracted to in the story, it's easier to say yes or no to something. And uh, I don't know, I think it's uh, stories. We're all born, it's, writing is almost like doing archaeology. I think all those stories are buried inside and life gives you the tools to dig them out. But it's all in there and it's a very intuitive thing. You, you know if something is, uh, when, when somebody approaches you with certain material, you know if it's something for you or not. So is it instantaneous for you that you, you hear the story and it's like, yes, I want to do that, no, I don't want to do that? Yes, and the times I've tried to go against that, I've always regretted it. it wow. <laughs> and talk to me a little bit about how, how you became involved in The Impossible, which, you know, you say that you have the stories inside you. Yeah. I, I don't believe you're a survivor of the tsunami. No. Um, but? Uh, well, there was, uh, we were, I was working on another movie with Juan Antonio at the time that it, it fell apart. And uh, 
the morning we got the news that that film wasn't going to get made, uh, Belena Tienza, our producer, walked in with uh, a story she had just heard on the radio, just like magic. And she played the podcast for us, and we listened to it, and by the end of it we were like uh, moved to tears, and we decided we wanted to make that. Um, but at that time, I, was, uh, I had just been uh, recovered from an, a very bad car accident that had kept me in hospital for months. So when I met Marie and she told me her story, I found a link in there, something in common with her, and I thought, this is something for me. And also, while I was writing the movie, I had uh, a sister and a niece diagnosed with cancer, and I had to deal with uh, um, the everyday small stuff with what happens when you face death and how it changes your life. And, and suddenly, when, when, when they came with that story, I thought, there's something that I can add to this. And that's why. Um, wow. Um, Stuart, on, on a probably a lighter <laughs> note slightly, um, where, where do your stories come from? I mean, I, I think I agree. They, we all have certain themes that we return to and things that interest us. And it's about kind of cultivating that ability to listen and to register when these ideas come. For me, I think I'm always fascinated by people or portions of society that seem other, that I find are actually not and are incredibly relatable and universal. And I'm always fascinated by making the other um, not seem like the other. So whether it's renegade priests and rabbis and keeping the faith or a porn star or a lesbian couple or I sex keeping addicts. the faith, I was going to say. Yeah. yeah. I, I, I love sort of l looking at them and not, I love not being at a distance from things. My favorite feeling is that immediacy where there's nothing between you and the character and you can project onto the character and you're like, I can't believe I'm projecting. I remember a lot of men came up to me after um, the kids are all right and said, you know, I've been married for 20 years and I watched that movie and I said, I'm, I'm Annette Bening. Yeah. I am that person. And that was fascinating to me. Um, so for me, I think my theme is about finding community and finding relatedness in that which seems other. Um, and when you have, so are, in the case of The Impossible, is it something that was brought to you? Yeah, are your ideas typically original, or is someone bringing? Like, it's keeping the faith. You're you're at home. One that day, was an original one. The only and it's one. It's a priest that and a rabbi, and and then they fall like, in love with the movie here. Yeah. Exactly, it's a bad bar joke that <laughs> I tried to make into a not bad movie. Um, and uh, the girl next door, which was the, the the boy who falls in love with the porn star, was it was a, a bad script that had been brought to me, and I thought, oh, there's a potential for a great teen dramedy there. So that's the only one that didn't come you know, from my imagination. But um, I love sort of whipping things up out of whole cloth. Um, personally, it just, it's just a wonderful feeling of invention and architecture that you're creating a world. I mean, there are a lot of wonderful stories that in real life that I would like to do too. It's just the way it's worked out for me. The ones that have gotten made are the ones I came up with. And when you have these ideas, like where did The Kids Are Alright come from? The Kids Are Alright came from uh, a conversation between Lisa Chilodenko and I, where we were both fans of each other's work and we had been friends for a long time. And I said, you know, Lisa, your movies are great, but they're so damn niche. You need to make something that's bigger and more accessible. And she's like, fuck you. You need to make movies that are more independent <laughs> and, and, you know, less commercial. I was like, all right, let's meet in the middle. And she goes, okay. And so she told me about this uh, thing she'd been thinking about, about doing a story about... Uh, uh, an alternative family about kids who meet their sperm donor. I said, it's funny because I was a sperm donor in college and I always wondered what would happen if kids tried to find me. And she was like, oh my God. And so we wrote that. <laughs> um, and Next question. I, I, you, you guys are both leaving me speechless at this point. Um, and, and thanks for sharing. Did Thank you and Matt meet in, in sex addiction therapy? Yeah, that Matt and I, no, Matt and I went to college together. We were, we'd been writing a few scripts before that, and when all this stuff started happening with Tiger Woods and, and Elliot Spitzer, we thought it was a really interesting subject matter to try to actually, because people were saying, oh, sex addiction doesn't exist, it's a joke, and it's like an excuse that men, you know, proffer when they get caught cheating, and, you know, I personally have known a lot of people in 12-step recovery and AA and in different things, and I've gone to a bunch of those meetings as, support and whatever, and I've found them to be fascinating. And I wanted to explore a world, not just through the prism, not that it's a, 
you know, a bad movie, but not just through the shame prism of the acting out. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see both sides because I'm fascinated about recovery in the same way that I'm fascinated about, you know, other spiritual movements as methods of, of forging new communities. Mm -hmm. And I felt like a sex addiction is this addiction that unlike, you know, heroin addiction or alcoholism, we haven't really seen it treated filmically a lot. So I thought it was a new kind of interesting novel ground to break. I think it's interesting, both of you, I mean, you with Juan Antonio, obviously, and you in your last two films with Lisa and with Matt, it sort of, it have sort of been a part of a, a collaboration that sounds like it began as a collaboration, rather than you, you generating a screenplay, uh, and then a director sort of picking up the, the proverbial baton and running the next leg of the relay. I'm curious for both of you, what was the actual process of writing the script with a collaborator? Um, or with, 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 with the knowledge that you had a collaborator either down the road or as a, as a sort of partial collaboration as you were writing the script, like how did you actually do the writing itself? Mm -hmm. Was it, I'm gonna write and then you, you know, I'll hand it, to, hand it off to you or uh, was it a sort of ongoing, we're gonna sit across the table from each other with laptops and you know, write each word alternately? No, I, I always write alone, sorry, alone and uh, I just, Lock my, I, there's this little house I have in the north coast of Spain and I go there, there's no phones, nothing. And I come back like a month later with a draft and I uh, show it to Juan Antonio in this case and then we talk about it for a while, he gives me some notes, it's like, I like this, I don't like this, I would like to explore this a little bit more. Then I go back and, and that's it, back and forth. But the writing, is the process of writing I feel is very intimate. I don't want anybody looking over my shoulder. Oh, That's so romantic. I, know. Like, I go to a house in the north coast of Spain, and it's like I'm like I sit in a shitty cafe in Los Angeles. Like, I was just gonna say I have a better idea why you don't live in Los no, Angeles. I'll show you pictures of the house. There's nothing remotely romantic okay. about All right. it. It certainly it certainly sounds it though. Yeah. Just don't um, show anybody. And let yeah, them exactly. Have to believe that. Let it's... us have our own impressions of that. Exactly. Um, yeah, I mostly you know, when I write alone, I, I either write you know by myself in my office. But what was interesting is in these collaborations with Lisa. I'm a control freak, so I'm always at the computer. She would sit right next to me, and for a couple of years, we were just glued at the hip. And we would talk out every, we, we spent like six months on the outline, and then we would talk out every scene before we wrote it, and act it out, and then start writing. What was interesting with Thanks for Sharing is, I wrote most of it in Los Angeles with Matt, who lived in LA, but he lived in the valley, which is far away from where I live. And we were both too lazy, so we Skyped the whole script. From, from like Venice to Burbank, is that basically? From like Hollywood to, to Encino. So, oh, so it wasn't even like the, the, the coast to the no, valley. No. It was like just over the hills to just yeah, over the hills. Exactly. So there's a pro on Skype, we could share the screen so he could see the script and I would be typing it and he would see the changes and we would just, we literally were never in the same room for the entire process. Never. You never did at one point in the entire Not process. At one point. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Now, do you actually feel like that's a sort of a, a, was that a, which would you prefer going forward? I like them both because you know there's a real intimacy and a, a you know real fun with having somebody right there. But mm. also with Lisa, she would need to hear about my social life for thirty. I was going to ask: Is it before. easier to procrastinate with yeah. the person actually in the room? And once with Skype, we're like, all right, let's go, let's do this. So we just got right into it. Now, do you find it was different being the co-writer with someone else directing or, and being the co-writer when you knew you were going to be directing? You know, it's interesting. During the... Yes, I, I think so, yes. I think with Kids Are Alright, there was, there was a lot of give and take and there was a lot of, well, you know, you are the director, so you're going to have to direct this. So, you know, I, I deferred to her more. I think with Thanks for Sharing because I knew I would be directing it, there was a little more, I, I, I took the reins, I think, a little more in that process. Got it. Um, Sergio, I'm curious for you, The Impossible was written in English? Or was it, is it in Spanish? I mean, as a sort of, your Spanish is obviously your first language. Yeah. Um, but you're obviously quite fluent in English as well and went to school in NYU. How, what is the process like writing, you know, well, in the case of The Impossible, it was relatively easy because basically you have to write lines of dialogues for five-year-olds and uh, German tourists in Thailand. <laughs> so I, I can handle that. Shakespeare, I could not do it, but this, this I felt comfortable with. Uh, actually, the very first draft was written in Spanish because it was going to be made in Spanish. And then once the budget came in, it's like, okay, it's not going to be in Spanish anymore. So <laughs> and, uh, but yeah, it was, uh, it was a bit of a stretch and I always felt very nervous, more than ever, when I sent the script out. It's like, oh, please just let somebody read it first, make sure it's, it doesn't have any horrible English in there. 
But uh, no, it was, it, was, it was fun. And, you know, since, since the film, since, since writing the script, I mean, for you, you, like you said, you don't like really anyone over your shoulder while you're writing the script. Is it, do, you, do you sort of accord Juan Antonio the same privilege uh, as director, or like, are you involved in the production at all? Are you, are you sort of giving him notes? Uh, that was not really how I imagined it. I'd really prefer if you do it this way. We step over each other's work all the time, but okay. uh, because we we've met making short films, and it's like uh, we belong to a generation in Spain where it's like suddenly it's like there's like all these new filmmakers because the film schools um, there was no film school in Spain, and then it's like ten years ago they had two one in Barcelona one in Madrid, and it's like we all work together and know each other and. Uh, we sort of do that all the time. Like is there a Barcelona Madrid rivalry as there is in football, or no? <laughs> yes, <laughs> <laughs> of course. And uh, so uh, again, he met me as a as a director, and uh, and I met him as a writer because he had he showed me something he had written, and uh, then we step over each other. It's like sometimes it's like I would he like cross one of my lines and write something. <laughs> And then when he's uh, when he's shooting, I I'm all, I'm always there, and I, I I was like coaching the kids in both films, and I'm always there in case he when he needs a scene rewritten or something, but always to like get a second opinion on the combo. It's like, did you like that? So it's like very mixed. And and I take it you're happy with the film as it turned out. I am very happy with the film. Uh, yes, that's, I think it's the first time I'm happy with something I've worked on. Wow. And for you, I mean, we talked a little bit about sort of this, but as when you were co-writing, were you there with Lisa on set, and then were you involved in that, and how was that experience for you? I mean, it, it was great. I it Is that what spawned you deciding to direct this? No, I wanted to direct for a long time. Um, and I was so sick and tired of saying, I really want to direct that I finally, I, you know, put my money where my mouth was. But my first movie, I actually produced Keeping the Faith, and Edward Norton directed, and he was one of my good friends. And I was a horrible writer in the sense that I was constantly going, no, no, you need to do it like this. And, and at a certain point, he's like, Stuart, you get one note per scene, and that's it. And I really annoyed the crap out of him. And I learned from that. And with Lisa, she's an amazing director. Absolutely. And I didn't, I felt confident that we had been talking about the scenes for so long that she was going to nail it. And so she was constantly looking to me more than I wanted to sort of go up and interrupt her. Sure. Um, so I really just kind of watched her work and would occasionally throw things in. But for me, I, I thought it was so wonderful that in all of my movies I'd been on set the whole time. That was my film school, was watching these people work. So that when I finally stepped up there, I wasn't clueless. I actually knew in some, in some way what I was doing. And how was the experience? Was Matt also on set? He movie? was, and he was like I was on Keeping the Faith. <laughs> and did you give him one note per scene? Which I actually think is pretty generous. I did. <laughs> I did. And you know what? His one note was often very good. There you go. So it was great. Um, I want to shift a little bit and talk about sort of writing for Hollywood. I feel like you guys have both, you know, obviously had a great deal of success sort of generating your own material. I'm curious about the process of, of being a writer for hire. Um, and, and I mean, you both have agents at the major agencies, and I'm sure there are a lot of you know people in jobs like mine calling and saying, "Hey, I have this terrible idea for a movie. What do you think?" Um, I, I, as writers who have had a great deal of creative freedom outside of the system, what is it like when you get those phone calls? Um, I mean, honestly, honestly, um, I mean, beat beat up people like me. Usually, we deserve it. So, no, I mean, Here, I here's think the venue. <laughs> I, I, I think, in large part, I started to try to do movies like Kids Are Alright and Thanks for Sharing because of a certain, I don't, I don't even know if frustration, I just acknowledged that there were limits of the stories I was going to be able to tell within a studio system. I love, I mean, the studio system pays a lot better than what I make making independent film. So it's that thing where, you know, I, I try to do a good job for the studio and make a living through them, and then I try to take that and, and kind of allow it to, you know, uh, allow me to make these other films. Right. Um, you know, you have to, the first thing when you're writing for the studio is you really have to think about who are you writing it for, what's the marketing, you know, it can't just be for 10,000 people, or it can't just right. be for your relatives, it has to be for everybody. And so that by definition is going to change and morph the subject matter, the way you treat it, the way you end it. It has to, you know, it has to have, it has to fall within certain parameters. Sir, how about you? Well, in my case, uh, being used to work in a like very small family-like environment, it's it's always very strange. 
when you get like on a phone call with seven people at the other end and you don't know who's talking and who's listening, who's sleeping while you talk. And uh, I don't know, for me, if I have to be uh, absolutely sincere, it's been, uh, it's been quite frustrating. Uh, both films I wrote for Hollywood, not in Hollywood, uh, none of those scripts got made. Uh, but then also it's like uh, I got paid like 10 times what I would get paid in Spain and that gives me like the comfort of like picking my next personal thing very carefully. So, so do you begin to feel like it's a situation where like you dip, you dip in for the paycheck which allows you the freedom to do that which you love? No, I would really love to get a film made <laughs> and good but it's, it's hard when you have to convince eight people and okay. about the, the, what you're doing and why. And also, well, well, one of them, when another project I made was, was with a uh, director involved, it was Matt Reeves, and that was a pleasure. Once a, uh, there's a director on board, everything is much easier. But when you have to deal with a studio and uh, six producers and blah, 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 then it becomes very complicated. Well, you, you probably find this in development. Now the, the, the trend is not towards, oh, let's write a good script and then go to the studio. No, you write a good script, you have to get an actor attached and a director attached. Yep. You basically have to show them what the movie's going to look like, and then you go to the studio and say, "We've done all the work for you. All you have to do is say yes." But, and, and they still may and say, they still "Well, that, that's all fine and good, but we prefer this version of that movie, even with that." Package. Exactly. Exactly. Um, do either of you have any particularly egregious uh, anecdotes to share? I always find those to be fun. You don't have to name names, but <laughs> I I have a funny story. Um, Two days before Girl Next Door started shooting, the head of the studio came to the director and myself and said, I have 19 notes, and if you don't do them all, I'm not going to make the movie. And we, he came to the production office, and we went through each one and got him down to two. <laughs> <laughs> and he was so angry. <laughs> um, I don't, you know, I think it's, I don't have any of the classic old Hollywood, you know, horrible stories. I have like the death of a thousand cuts right. kind of things where you, they just wear you down over time. And those, then, those are the new Hollywood stories. Yeah. yeah. I, don't know. I cannot think of one that wouldn't be recognizable and I have to be careful. Fair enough. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, I, I'm curious because I feel like as, as different as each of your individual projects are, I feel like the, there, there's also the reality in, in, in Hollywood of sort of getting typecast. Um, as doing a certain sort of thing. And I imagine after the orphanage, you got offered every horror movie that Hollywood was trying to make. We make uh, a sequel, yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I imagine you get every sort of sex-related comedy, particularly if there's a slightly alternative lifestyle involved at all. Yeah, I, I don't, I mean, I think I, they look at me and they're like, oh, he's the character guy. Um, and... You know, so they wouldn't call me in. If, if it was an action movie, it would be like, okay, this this, guy, this, this movie's going next week, and you make yeah, the people can you make them seem three dimensional right. in two days, um, things like that. The money's good with that, though. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, yeah, so you got and and, and do, do, how do you deal with the idea of saying, you know what? Yes, I've done a horror movie, but I want to do something different next, or I've done, uh, you know, a sort of psychological thriller, and, and this, you know disaster movie that might even feel like a psychological thriller and now I want to do, I mean, I don't know if you want to do a comedy, but if you, if, how, do you, how do you deal with sort of changing direction? I would love to do a comedy, only I, I think you have to be extremely talented to write comedy and I don't think I'm that talented. <laughs> and uh, I think it's the hardest thing to do. But no, but with, in my case, it was, I, I was really, I really wanted to do something completely different. I didn't want, I, I have many friends who made a first movie that was a horror film and then got stuck doing horror films for three, four, years to come and so my obsession was not do genre and uh, and then again with the next one it's like hopefully we'll have something different I think it's important to like put yourself in very different places mm -hmm. and I, I was lucky enough to do that with uh, with our production company in Spain that I think of because they had made so much money with the other one that they were sort of <laughs> like waiting it's like okay whatever you want um, uh, we'll see with this one <laughs> we'll see what happens with the third film I would say one thing to, to people who are thinking about being writers, which is people will typecast you, and the only way to break out of any kind of box you get in, and first of all, you're lucky to be in a box, because that means people are thinking about you to put you in a box. But if you're in a box, the only way to get out is to show them by actually writing something else that's something else. So you can't go, why can't my agent, your agent can't do anything unless you give them 
the uh, material and the weapon to go out with it. So I would do that. But if you want to be taken seriously as an ex, you have to deliver ex. And that's, that's it. Yeah, and, and as somebody who sits on the other side of that table, I couldn't agree more. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is, you know, when your agent calls me to say that you've written a giant action movie, I will read it because it says Stuart Lumberg on it. Though I will have no idea what to expect. And if it's great, then I'm an action guy. And exactly. If and if it's not, then I'm not. Then, then, you're, then you're still the sort of character guy. Yeah. Which is, again, not a bad place to be. Um, so I think now is as good a time as any to turn it over to questions from, wow, the very large audience now. Um, so just raise your hand and there are microphones that they will bring to you. Um, and here they come. So I think we'll start right here. Or I guess we'll start there and then we'll go there. No, or, no we'll start there. Hi, this question is for Stuart. When you were writing and you knew you were going to be directing the film, did that influence your writing? I mean, did you write seeing it as a director, seeing it more visually? Um, yeah, it's a good question. You know, it's funny. I think I've, I've always written visually. And as I've seen more productions, I actually know what's entailed in productions. And I really think, how, you know, how is this going to look? How is this going to cut? So I tried to. What was interesting was when I was directing the movie, I would look at the script and I would go, who the hell wrote this? You know, I wasn't thinking of this and this. So it doesn't matter. You can think about it in, the, in that way, but only when someone puts on a director's hat can you really think about it in terms of how, how you're actually going to shoot it in a real location. But I always think it's good. I remember reading in a book once, somebody saying, don't tell the director like what the camera move is or whatever. It's like the director's gonna figure that out. Give them the mood, give them the atmosphere, give them the intention that they can then translate into a shot list. Uh, again, for Stuart, what would, you say, what would you say the most challenging part of uh, doing collaborations? When people disagree with you. <laughs> um, I think the challenging part is, it's also the best part, by the way. It's having the sounding board that isn't just a sounding board going yes, 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 but is saying, is fighting and, and challenging your assumptions. And you, you have to prove yourself. And you, you can't just win the point because of, it's not might makes right. You actually have to, if it's gonna be any good, try to come to some kind of consensus or one person has to win the other person over. But I think that's also a strength of collaboration. It's actually a question I want to put to you, Sergey, as well. You, you know, you, the, the dynamic for you, Stuart, seemed to be very collaborative. Like you guys are sort of working together constantly, whereas yours seems to be a much more iterative process where you go off, you write an entire draft, you share it with Juan Antonio, he gives you a set of notes, and then you go back and adjust it. How do you handle when you think that his note's idiotic? Oh, I, I've never once thought that, that they were idiotic. <laughs> or when you disagree with one. And, and, and also I was be in, quite so pointed. With this movie, it wasn't just him. It was uh, We had a producer attached from the very beginning, Belen, and she was there all the time. And also Maria, whose, uh, whose story we're telling, was, was there. She, she would come like every week and see where we were at. And, uh, and it, felt, it really felt like a family. I think that's the way movies should be made. You have to, I think if you, if you have the good luck to assemble a team you can trust, then that's perfect. It's just that part of the actual writing that but, you want to stay. But, but are there times, not necessarily in this film, but just in general, wh are, where you've written something that you are particularly attached to, and for whatever reason, it, it either can't happen or there is someone who is adamant that that is not the direction to go? Yes. There was how, 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 how do you handle those situations? Uh, well, you scream and yell, and then you you hug the person you have in front of you. There's one scene in the movie. It's the the one scene. I don't want to spoil anything, but if if you guys see it, it's the one scene with uh, Geraldine Chaplin. Um, that was my favorite scene in the film, and uh, Juan Antonio had a problem with it. Maria loved it, and it was they shot that scene on the very last day of shooting. If something else had gone wrong, it wouldn't have been in there. And I, I, I feared whenever they showed me a cut, I was like, please tell me the scene is still in there. And, and now it, it's in the movie, and it's, and it's great. And, but it sometimes it takes a while to get people to see why something needs to be in the screenplay. Uh, but was there a point then during post-production, as they're editing the film, where everyone realized that you were right, that this was the most important, this was a, a significant moment yes. that needed to be preserved? No, it, it was a very quiet moment. But yeah, it was like, uh, I saw the film, it's like, when, once the scene was over, I was like, so that means it's staying? And Juan Antonio was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> After 
three years of fighting and screaming and stuff, and, and I said, like, thank you. <laughs> You're brave. Okay, I'm Ziggy. Um, I just want to ask two questions very quickly. One is, uh, it seems to me comedies and horror are really the big thing right now, and I don't write either very well. I tried comedy, but I don't know. But I do animation, so. But uh, the other question is uh, about technology. How does this affect the writer today? Because I'm not good at technology, but it seems to be you really have to think about where you're going to write to fit in with what is going on with the new technology and you know all these iPads, this, that, and how to fit this movie into YouTube and you know all this kind of thing. So I just wondered uh, because you didn't mention technology, and I think it's an important issue at the moment. Thank you. I, I think that you should write about te technology if you want to, and if you don't want to, there are plenty of great stories. You know, I think you know Steven Spielberg has his movie Lincoln coming out, and it's not going to have a lot of technology in it. Um, it might be shot with new technology, but I I think that you should just focus on stories that compel you, and that's the first. You know, that's the that's your big priority. I think um, what, where technology is interesting is if you're gonna shoot a low budget movie, it can change what you can do with how much. And I'm really curious about, you know, clearly there was a lot of very inventive use of, of technology in your film to do what you needed to do. Yes, I, I, then again, my producer told me, it's like, because since I've done short films and stuff, it, whenever I write something, I'm thinking, it's like, okay, so this is 50 extras, so blah, 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 it's a vehicle, trash, and so, oh, this is gonna be so expensive, let's do it again. And then when the tsunami scene came over, it's like, can I just go crazy with this? And she told me, go ahead, and it's like, uh, time and reality will put us in our place, and you don't have to worry about what's gonna be done digitally, Thank God, nothing was done digitally in the film. It's all, all real water. We just had to. Uh, really? Yeah. Wow. wow. It's uh, amazing. it's eight minutes of film that took a month to shoot. Yeah. And, if uh, that's that should just be on the that's trailer. Than my right. share. <laughs> <laughs> that's not a reason to see the movie. I don't know what it is. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's like if you're lucky, then you can do that, and it's somebody else's problem to <laughs> how they're gonna do it. Hi. I had a question. Um, I just wanted to know, actually, what your relationship was, both of you, with your producer, because how and whether you actually form a front uh, and have a certain agreement with the director for the final cut and sort of fight for it, or what that dynamic was all about. Is Bill McLeory here? Where's Bill McLeory? Could you raise his hand? Is he gone? My producer. Uh, back there, back in the corner. That's my producer, and um, he's amazing, and he. We have a company together with the actor Edward Norton, and um, what, a, what a good producer's job is, is to help a writer and a director fulfill their vision. And with Thanks for Sharing, we have financiers who are also producers, and they're wonderful. Uh, they did this movie Beginners that was at Toronto a couple years ago, and they did Rabbit Hole and The Oranges last year. And when it came down to final cut, they said, well, there's no way you're getting that. You're a first time director, and I said, you're right. But they're very fair, and they said, so let's come up with something. And we came up with an idea, which is that a screening would decide a disagreement. So if we had a disagreement about, you know, this scene goes too far, or it doesn't go far enough, if I said, we know it's graphic, but we need to have it, we would screen it, we would have a questionnaire, and some directors might say, I hate that, and I don't care what, you know, the masses think, I'm gonna do what I think, but actually I was interested, and I was willing to let the numbers win out. And luckily, I was able to prove almost everything through screenings. And we sort of honored that agreement. So we never really got into a problem, which was very fortunate. In my case, I, w I was really lucky both times. Uh, the first time, producers of the film were Joaquin Padrón and Marta Garona, but uh, Guillermo del Toro was like floating. <laughs> above and uh, he basically told us just use my name whenever you want it's like it was like a magic card whenever, whenever there was a problem i was like we're gonna call guillermo <laughs> see what he thinks it, and he was great he had like three meetings with us and he said what he thought it's like this is, a, this is what i my opinion i think you should give the audience three moments to jump and other than that do whatever you want and uh, so he was great, and, uh, and Juan Antonio is always controlling everything. And in the second one, Benedetti is just the most wonderful producer you could wish for. 
she's a mother, a friend, she's, she, she never sleeps. <laughs> and uh, she has such a passion and love for what she's doing. She just completely dedicated the last three years of her life to this film. And uh, I hope to be doing many more films with her. How do you say 600 pound gorilla in Spanish? Do you know that expression? Yeah, un gorilla de 600 fino. Un perro rabioso en la habitación. It's awesome. I was also going to say, these experiences are maybe not representative. They're not. They're not at all. <laughs> and if we had made, you know, if I had made movies with other, you know, producers who ran mini majors that we know of, they would have taken the movie away and recut Absolutely. them. They would have had three editors working on them simultaneously, screen them, and then taken them away. So, right. fortunate. But I think it's, it's, it speaks very highly of the producers with which they're working um, that, that this is the experience because it is definitely not the norm. Yes. But good for you guys. Where, where's, where's the microphone? <coughs> do you have the mic or do you need the mic? Okay. Hi, I had a question about your, your writing process. Um, well, actually, I want to know, you know, a script that you each think is kind of like a masterwork, um, a film. A script of our own or a no, script no, no, no. of someone else's? Somebody else's script that you think um. is like, you know, just amazing. But before that, I want to know about your writing process. I mean, um, how long is your writing day? How do you get in the zone? Do you listen to music? Um, what do you guys do to kind of get into that place where you can feel good coming out at the end of the day? In the north of Spain. In <laughs> <laughs> Spain, mine is uh, something like being a bulimic. You stuff yourself to death and then you puke. Um, meaning, I, I spend a lot of time like uh, drawing ideas and three by on little cards, and it's like my whole room is covered with cards and stuff. I'm not really thinking about a structure. I'm just like trying to think of all the different directions where I could go. I do research on my characters and the story, and once I feel I know I've eaten everything, then I just go and then lock myself in a room, and then I come out of that with, uh, after two weeks, I have a draft. Of course, it's not going to be a good draft, but it's something to start working on. And then I sort of like step away from it and come back, and it's like periods of two weeks in, two weeks out, until the director is happy. Sometimes it's three months, sometimes it's three years. <laughs> now, 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 does the research and the sort of the gorging part of the bulimia happen at, at this house in the north of Spain? Or is, no, is, that, no, no. is that just the puking? No, the, no that, that's just the puking. <laughs> so see, no, no romance at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, the great thing about if you ever get to be a writer and make a living is everything's research. Yeah, I'm going to this movie at two, <laughs> two in the afternoon. It's what? It's research. And, um, but um, it, it also depends if someone's paying you to write the script. If someone's paying you to write the script, I'll probably work a lot harder because I have to turn it in in eight to 12 weeks and they don't care about the artistic process, you turn it in. Um, if, it's, if it's up to me and no one's paying me, I'll spend months doing an outline, which is the most, for me, most important part of writing. I can't fake it unless I have an outline. I need to know, at least for movies, where it starts, where it goes, and where it ends. That'll take anywhere from a month to two or three and then I usually wake up, do whatever, get down with my computer around eight or nine, write till lunch. Maybe I'm lucky to get an hour or two after that, but really it's those four hours in the morning that are precious to me. And I just turn off the phone, I, I make sure I don't go on and check my email every 10 seconds. And it's hard to do now, but that to me is, is the most important thing. Finding when, but also your time might be two in the morning. It's finding what your biorhythm is and then just honoring that as best you can. Music, no music? I used to have, I wrote a few scripts to the same album over and over. <laughs> this, this album by Bill Frizzell called Nashville, I wrote five scripts to, to that, that one album. To that one album. So it's not like I chose an album for each different script like some people. It became like a Pavlov's dog response. <laughs> I put the music <laughs> on. Yours immediately. <laughs> you know, it was a mentoring candidate thing. We'd play a game of solitaire. I really wish we had that album here right now. Um, uh, where, where is the microphone now? Or is there someone with a question? Oh. Hi, I've got a question about writing. Um, I guess there are certain templates approach to structure and film, but uh, all films are different. I'm wondering if there's like a, a internal kind of benchmark system that you find for generally 
for each of your approach to writing? Like by minute six, you feel like this should have happened or, or that kind of thing. I, I'm going to say something that most screenwriters probably would hate to hear. And, you know, I've written with, very, I, you know, very fancy screenwriters. And I'll tell you something. There's a book out there. And there are a lot of books, and most of them are horrible. There's a book called Save the Cat. <laughs> People, you may hate it. I actually think, even if it's the dumbest thing, and the guy who wrote the book wrote some horrible scripts, he's kind of right. <laughs> there are certain things that you kind of, you know that thing you have to know the rules to break the rules? Like, if you don't know any of the rules, you'll break all the rules and you won't even know what you've done, and it'll just be bad. I do think there is an inherent logic to a script. And I think that by watching lots of great movies, by reading lots of great scripts, you kind of take in the DNA. And I do think that there are certain rules and certain things should happen. And, and plot point B should be bigger than plot point A. And the thing you set up in minute 10 does need to pay off. You know? And so I would say if there are screenwriters out there, you could do worse than buy that book. I'm not, and I'm not getting paid to say that. Um, learn the structure. Really learn the structure. It's important. Yes. Uh, hmm. I don't agree. <laughs> Here we go. Well, no, it, it's, it's good to know, again, it's like you can only break the rules once you know what the rules are. But um, with this, I, and I actually I had a really horrible time reading Save the Cat. It's like, it's like, and, and then it's like most of the things I read in there were it's like, I know you're right, but some of these examples. I bet you the impossible totally follows Save the Cat. Yeah, completely, yes. No. Uh, <laughs> and actually, I was horrified when I turned in the screenplay because it's, uh, it doesn't follow all the basic rules. It's a screenplay in, in four acts with, an, with a prologue and an epilogue, and it switches the protagonist in the middle of the film. And I was like thinking, I'm gonna get so much shit for this. <laughs> and it's the only time I've turned in the script that I, 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 didn't get a, I, I didn't get a note from any of the other parts involved. Everyone said, it's perfect. I, I don't know why it works. And, uh, but at least on page it did. So sometimes you just have, it's good to have like the map, but the fun is in the detours and it's like making some unexpected turns, I think. So did you feel any, I mean, it, it sounds like you did feel some added anxiety being aware that it didn't follow the rules, yeah, but having first, an instinct that it worked. My first job was as a reader and going through all those things, and it's like, oh my God, I'm going to get killed. None of those apply. I, I want to double back, actually, to, to the gentleman's question. Is, is, there, is there a masterwork that, that you look to in sort of the history of film, like the, a screenplay that you say that, if I could do that, Bring it. Um, well, I mean, there's whole scripts. I think Double Indemnity is an amazing script. Billy Wilder was one of the great screenwriters to ever work in Hollywood. I think that obviously everyone says Chinatown and they're right. Chinatown is a movie that in many ways broke all the rules and yet still coheres. I think that for a scene, if you look at the first scene of The Social Network, it's one of yes. the greatest scenes ever Agreed. written. Agreed. Um, you know, but then there are a lot of great there are a lot of great scripts that are you know maybe have no dialogue in them, but they're amazing. Like, you know, Lost in Translation is probably a horrible script to read, but she knew exactly what she wanted. You know, and so it's an eighty page script. Yeah, but it's brilliant. Anything by Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, same thing. You yeah. read it, you're like, I don't know what this movie's gonna look like, but then right. you read it, having seen the film, it's a completely different experience, and you see the structure, and and the human sort of character there. Mm -hmm. I agree. What about you? Uh, I, I would kill to write something like The Apartment someday. <laughs> and, uh, and, or Rosemary's Baby, which is like the perfect uh, suspense movie, I think. And what you don't get to see and how it's put on the page. And, uh, but then again, just not, not to talk about ancient films. Yesterday I saw Looper and it blew me away. Um, it's, uh, you know, you get so used to know all the, again, the rules and stuff that you kind of anticipate where the film is going. And yesterday I had no idea. And it, I, I had such a fun ride with it. I, I loved it. I felt like I was 13 seeing the Terminator on my, VC, on my VHS that <laughs> tape for the first time. And it was great. And yes, you know, the, after the movie, some people were having discussions about it. But it's like, there's nothing I value more in a film than not knowing where it's going to take me. And I loved it. I'll give you that. 
Um, just in terms of your career as writers, what's the one thing that you wish you knew when you were starting? For both of you. So when you were an investment banker, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what do you wish you had known about screenwriting that you? Now? I think I, I wish I had had, had committed earlier to write, to finding my voice and, and really working on that as opposed to worrying about what the market wanted. I think um, the markets want great scripts, and so so I, I would say focus more on what you want to say and less what you think people want to hear. And with me, I, I, I just wish I had been more fearless from the beginning. I was like, there's not just terrified of the blank page, but like really physically ill. Um, because I felt that I was like intruding. It's like, again, I was like thinking, I'm a director who needs a screenplay. I'm, I'm, I have to pretend I can write. And then it's like, it took lots of years till that I actually could like call myself a writer and be comfortable with it. And, and actually enjoy it. And if I, if I could have all those years back, I'd be very happy. So that's my advice, be fearless when you write. No more questions? No one? No? In the back and we'll go back to you. I just wanted to know if you, uh, how uh, screenwriting for you as a business has changed like in the last 10 years, if it's if changing technologies and maybe burgeoning people entering the field has changed how you guys work or how you have to approach the industry. Has it changed at all? Well, I think it used to be much easier to be a screenwriter. I think there's a lot more money around. And I think like all industries, whether it's music or you know, television or, or, or movies, the money's had to get smarter and tighter. And so I think that you have to be really mindful now of, of why you're writing what you're writing, which might seem to, to you know, countermand what I just said, which is just focus on your voice. But I do think that you kind of, you, here, here's, my, here's my theory now is that, especially with movies, given that we can watch things on the internet and we can watch things on TV, why would you go pay money and go to a theater? And my theory now is that we're going for a real experience. And I think like something like The Impossible, that like that movie is gonna suffer in translation if you just watch it on a TV. But like when you go to a theater, like you are going to get an experience of being in a tsunami. And so that's why horror movies do really well, because you're going for a visceral experience. Or comedies do well, because you're going to laugh amongst people. So you gotta think about what's a shared experience that is, is so great in a theater that loses something when you translate it down to a smaller medium. Given that, I mean, the kids who are right is not necessarily something that, do, I mean, do you feel like the kids who are right or, or that I say that, so I break the rules because I know the rules. Okay, all right. I just, want to be, I just want to be clear because, I mean, I would argue that that, that film it can be enjoyed just as much in the, in the pleasure of your home with your 50-inch TV can as it can, it can with the, 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 the reason I think those movies can work is because very few good movies are getting made anymore. And I know that sounds ridiculous, but like if you actually make a really good movie, there are a lot of people who are starved to go see good movies, and they will go see yep. them in the theater. So, um, but something, but again, like that movie starts out as a comedy, but it becomes very emotional. It becomes a very <laughs> um, kind of engaging story, and it can't just be a little movie where nothing happens. Something actually happens in that movie. Right. So I still try to think about the audience having a real visceral experience, even if it wasn't an action movie, it was an internal action movie. Absolutely. Um, actually, since we, yeah, we're trying to get people who have not yet asked a question, but if we got time, we'll come back to you. So go ahead. Um, could you just talk about how you feel about the status of writers in film? Um, even this festival kind of defines the movies by who, that they show by who directed them first. Whereas, you know, uh, I can't remember any of the names of the directors of episodes of the newsroom, but I know that Aaron Sorkin wrote it. So, like, could you talk about the status of, of writers and films? Well, as TV and film are very different. TV is a writer's medium. It just is, because you have to write so much. You know, you've got 13 episodes or whatever, and 10 episodes in the case of the newsroom. And um, it's just, it's a, it's a dialogue-driven medium. And film often is just is much, it's just much more visual and it's it's much more a director's medium. Which is not to say that there aren't superstars like Charlie Kaufman or Aaron Sorkin who work in 
in, in film as well. Um, but yeah, no, I think the status of writers in film is low. And I think the only way you can tell the status, the, 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 the necessity of writers is that they get paid very well when they're successful. And that's the studios begrudgingly going, yeah, I, I guess we kind of need you. Because honestly, like, not everyone can sit in front of a blank page and write something that's engaging. And that's, that's how you recognize the worth, is that they actually pay you. If you weren't worth anything, they wouldn't pay you. Yeah, I mean, the reality is very few people, I think, can sit in front of a blank page and, and deliver a script that winds everybody up and makes people want to do it. And it is a, a rare skill. And when, it is, when it's done and done consistently, they will pay you. And that, that is certainly the, the mark of Hollywood's valuing of anything, let's be honest. But even that said, that said though, I would say, and I say this is someone again on the other side of the table, writers are hideously undervalued given the role that I personally think they play in the process of making films. Um, it, it's frankly still astounding to me and one of the things that I've dedicated my career to, so. Also it's difficult because the way the system is works, it's sometimes uh, you're burning as a writer and then somebody else steps in and rewrites you and then somebody else rewrites you and then an executive puts everything upside down and then blah, blah, blah. So again, it's like, who can claim authorship of a screenplay where there's like seven people and against one director? But sure. because with, with theater, for example, it's like when you go see a play, it's always, uh, it's Tennessee Williams, The Glass Menagerie, it's not whoever's directing it. Um, you could argue that film is a, is a visual medium and therefore the director is the author. But I think it's like it's always a team effort, and uh, it's not always that everything gets recognized. But then again, if, if you do your job right, eventually, if you make enough movies, then you, I think nobody dubs certain screenwriters who have done like a lot of films, and then I think they get to that author. Like some of you, you said, you mentioned the social, the social network, and everyone, is, and you see the poster, and it's David Fincher, Aaron Sorkin. It doesn't always happen, but I think justice is made along the way. Back in the back. Uh, Sergio, how did you choose your agent? And uh, Stuart, um, has anybody ever told you not to direct your screenplay because it's too controversial? And how did you do that, if that happened? I didn't choose my first agent. I bumped into him at a party last night. <laughs> and uh, he was very kind, actually. Uh, no, it, it just happened to be someone who, we, we had a screen of the Orphans at the Cannes Film Festival, and Guillermo introduced both me and Juan Antonio to him. And I was like very happy because like, hey, I'm going with this great agent. He has 150 great clients. And uh, of course I was like number 256. And uh, so it's basically, I think you need to, you need to find someone who really knows what you want to do, who really knows your taste, someone who's going to send you maybe a novel or a book or a rewrite once every once a month, every two weeks, instead of sending you like, this is everything that's out there. Read it all, I don't have time. Um, um, so yeah, it's basically finding someone who knows you, who knows what your passions are, and, and, and there's a lot. And I, always go, I, I would always suggest go with someone small, instead of someone taking care of many important people. Coming from someone who just made two films from Spain, I don't know. <laughs> that's the only advice I can give you. Uh, no one told me not to direct this movie because of the subject matter. Um, no, they were all supportive. I'll, I'll, I'll sort of add, get a little different question though, Stuart, is, is in, let's say hypothetically you would gotten advice from an agent or a manager or someone that represents you, and hey, maybe don't do this next, maybe do this next. How, how do you handle your relationship with your representatives when it comes to, I'm absolutely committed to doing this thing next, and your rep says, Maybe not the best idea. Like, how do you how do you negotiate those differences of opinion w when they exist? Yeah, I mean, I think again, like anything, no one is going to manage your career better than you do. Um, agents can help facilitate that. Um, there are times when, and I love my agent. I see my agent angling because there's easy money in something, and I have to ask myself, okay, am I willing to take the next three to six months and? get that with my eyes on a different prize. And there are a lot of times I say no because I actually want to do this and clear the decks. But um, you, it's a conversation and I think like, you know, I think like Sergio says, they have to know you and you have to know them and you have to be on the same page of where you're going. 
and if and then you can have a dialogue where you know you can figure these things out together. Well, in, in my case, that I know the precise moment where I, I knew I I could trust Rich Kluber, who's my agent right now. It's like they offered me to write the American remake of the orphanage, and they basically said we want the same thing, just put it in English, and that's it. <laughs> and uh, and more ghosts. <laughs> that's what they said. <laughs> And so I called Rich, and it's like, hey, they call me to do this. It's, a, it's the easiest paycheck of my life. And he says, no, you're not doing it. And I'm like, why? It's like, no, you just made another a, a film to establish that you can do other things. And it's a great film, and it's going to open great things for you. You're not doing that. And it's like, but it's a lot of money. And well, it's like, it doesn't matter. I'm here to take care of your career. And I'm like, OK, fine. Okay. <laughs> We're screw back, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, I think we have, that, what's the time situation like, uh, Toronto? Five to five. Five to five? One more. One more question. And the person with the mic's got it. Stand up. Uh, hi there. I'm, I'm speaking, I guess, on behalf of TIFF Studio. We're a group of 16 of us that have been selected here as uh, um, from the OMDC and Ubisoft, and we're a think tank, the first ever TIFF Studio program, talking about transmedia trends and um, looking at sharing in an open source way between writers, directors, creators, producers in that group. And many of us are writers, producers, directors, creators. So my question on behalf of TIFF Studio is what's the importance of thinking from a transmedia place right now as a writer? And is it more advantageous for writers to think as a producer and become more of a writer-producer, to be able to have more control over their work. Can I ask you, what's transmedia? Let <laughs> 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 me, 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 me do a little bit of translating here. Thank you. Um, to the, so the, there's, there's this notion in Hollywood right now of, of, the, of their sort of transmedia property. And what that basically means is a property that can be, uh, and I think this is the wrong word, but exploited on a number of different platforms, whether that be Film and a, film and a TV show, film and a video game, film and a sort of you know MMORPG, like those sort of massive multiplayer online role playing games. Um, and so the question is, I, neither of you strike me as the types who are interested in, in making films that will then be you know a video game uh, immediately afterwards. Though the thanks for sharing game might be a hell of a lot of fun, <laughs> um, as by the way might be impossible. But um, but as you think about. Uh, the, your original ideas or the ideas that you're generating, do you think about them as being uh, stories that can be told in universes beyond film? Um, and to what extent are you interested in the idea of stories that you know, aren't just limited to the theatrical motion picture experience? Well, uh, I, I think it's the story that dictates what it needs to be. Sometimes it's a short film, sometimes it's something that needs uh, to be a miniseries for TV, and now there's a lot of new windows where you could do things. And uh, actually, the, the film I'm writing now, which I plan to direct next year, uh, it's, it's going to end up being a novel, because I, I started like doing the, the diaries for uh, all the characters, and, and, and maybe, who knows, some of those things could be... I'm thinking because I'm like very old, uh, maybe like extras on the DVD, but maybe they could be like some little pieces you could put on the internet before the films or uh, to create some interest on it. But I think, I cannot think of, okay, I have to do a transmedia project. I, I, it, the story has to come to you and speak to you and get you emotionally involved and then you find that what's the greatest output. But I'm, I'm hoping, I've, I've been in meetings when where people tell me it's a transmedia thing and there's going to be a video game and, and usually I'm like, I'm a storyteller, <laughs> don't tell me this. But I don't know, maybe tomorrow. <laughs> yeah, people are different. There's the whole pre-existing awareness thing where it's like, you know, you do Battleship because it's a game and it's a this and a that and I think that's, I understand why people do that. That's, that's sort of not how I think, so I'm, I'm probably not that good. I think it depends on who you are and what you're interested in, honestly. All right, well, thank you all for coming. Um, thank you. And thank you for uh, all